An engine fit for a do-it-yourselfer. I don't think so. In fact, I can't even find the dipstick. Although there might be a reason for that. That's this week on Motoring 2006. TSN's Motoring 2006 is brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses and Michelin, a better way forward. It was in 1990 that Toyota introduced Lexus. It was to be the company's luxury division. And you know, I remember my first drive behind the wheel of the Lexus LS400. You know, it was like being in your living room, sitting in your most comfortable chair. It was luxury with a capital L. And the LS400 was successful, although it did appeal to an older audience. Meanwhile, the Germans were showing that you can have luxury and also performance together. So Lexus responded with the IS luxury sedan and when it came to styling, or le finesse, as Toyota likes to call it, you can't beat the current GS series. Well, this week, we're in beautiful Kelowna, British Columbia, to meet the fifth-generation Lexus ES. Now, this vehicle is considered entry-level, but as we have learned, the ES could also be the most important vehicle in the Lexus family. It's our second best selling uh, vehicle in the Lexus lineup. Our best seller is the RX350 now. Um, this one we're expecting to sell as many or more than we did last year. We had a phenomenal year last year, so we don't want to get our hopes up too high, but we're expecting to sell more. In Canada, luxury low, as we call it, is the most important segment of the luxury market. Luxury sales in Canada are about 100,000 units, and Luxury Low represents about half of that. The ES is very important because it is a core vehicle for, for Lexus. It's maybe not our flagship vehicle, but it's certainly the vehicle that we're going to sell the most of on the car side, for sure. From really concentrating on luxury, the last few years what we've done is add a lot more dynamic driving ability to our vehicles, a lot more performance and the capabilities. And most importantly, in the last couple of years and the last launches we've done, concentrate a lot more on styling, we've got a lot more interesting emotional uh, appeal to the car, rather than just being such a rational uh, buy. Well, styling is based on the, the concept of El Finesse and that styling is designed to appeal to a broader range of people. People that will want a sporty look but still want to be a little bit understated on, uh, on styling and standout characteristics of the car. So if you look at the, the front line, the hood, um, it's typical of our, our new El Finesse styling so it's got a little bit of aggression to it but if you look at the back you'll see a little bit of refinement and, and conventional uh, luxury car. It's virtually been completely redesigned from the previous model. It, it, it's built on uh, an extension of previous platforms, but it's all new, all new equipment, all new amenities, all new uh, powertrain. It's a 3.5 liter V6 engine versus a 3.3 liter V6 engine. All new six speed transmission versus a five speed in the ES330. So it's, it provides a lot more power, a lot more uh, torque. Um, up, but at the same time a lot more comfort than the previous generation ES. This is not an entry level car to me, I think this is quite upscale, it's as nice as a big LS used to be a few years ago. It's very refined, I, I drove out to this event in a very expensive car, uh, twice the price of this, and uh, it didn't feel any more refined than this car does, I think they've done an amazing job. The ES is definitely a step in the right direction. Very little Camry-esque feelings about it. And uh, I will tell you this, do not speak to the chief engineer on the ES and talk about Camry. They don't like it. He's taken the ES350 to a completely new plateau. There's everything about this car, with the exception, of course, of the obvious Camry underpinnings, is very, very unique. Powertrain is seamless. It's exactly what you expect out of a Lexus, regardless of the obvious Toyota lineage. 
Lexus continues to improve stuff. I mean, you, you drive one of their models and you think, how can they get any better than this? But you drive the new one and it's better and the, everything seems to be, uh, it fits better, the level of luxury is better, there's more technology packed into the car. It's astonishing that they keep achieving this and I, I wonder where it'll all end. Old soldiers never die, sometimes they don't even fade away. More later on Kenzie's Corner. You know, for the past few years, Mazda has hit home run after home run. Everything from the RX-8 to the Mazda 3 to the Mazda Miata, they have all been home runs. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at the CX-7. Now, this is another vehicle Mazda wants to see disappear from the ballpark. Put a few kilometers on the CX-7's clock and one thing comes through loud and clear. This is a driver's car in every sense of the word. Through the pylons, it ducked and weaved like a seasoned veteran. The front struts and multi-link rear suspensions, complete with anti-roll bars at both ends, keeps body roll well within acceptable limits. Likewise, understeer stays out of the equation until you start flirting with the edge of the handling envelope. You know where this CX-7 really differs from your stereotypical SUV? Well, it's the way it's laid out. Great set of dials, very nice steering wheel, a little bit of piano black which adds a touch of class. It's more like the RX-8 than it is the Tribute. The other thing you can do, if you throw 10 grand at the base model, well you end up with a power moonroof, full leather, a navigation system that also doubles. When you select reverse, this screen shows you what's going on behind the vehicle through a backup camera. Now this thing really is worth the money because the sight lines to the rear, well they're not so clever. Obviously, having a meaty set of 235-60R18 tires helps the handling cause, but so does the electronic stability and traction control systems. The other likeable trait is the feedback delivered by the steering. Unlike so many crossovers and SUVs, which feel as though there's a length of knicker elastic somewhere between the steering wheel and steered wheel, the CX-7 steering is nicely weighted and direct to the feel. The rear seat environment has been thought through equally well as the front. To begin with, the seats are off the ground enough that you've got somewhere to put your toes, plenty of knee room and headroom is a non-issue. It's also very comfortable. Now on the practical side, with the seats in the upright position, 840 litres of cargo capacity. Pop the seats down, which is a painless venture, and it more than doubles. The powertrain hints at what you can expect to see a lot of in coming years, a four-cylinder engine that's married to a turbocharger. In the case of the CX-7, it means a blown 2.3-litre four-cylinder engine that puffs out 255 horsepower and a very rewarding 258 pound-feet of torque at just 2,500 RPM. Aside from a minor bout of turbo lag off the line, this engine speeds the CX-7 on with a great deal of enthusiasm. Marrying it to a six-speed automatic transmission with a manual mode then ensures there's a gear for just about every eventuality. As a package, it's a good one that delivers better fuel economy than a V6 with similar horsepower might do. Just don't lean on the turbo too hard. The other place this CX-7 really does differ from a traditional SUV, it's not very good off-road and it boils down to the fact it's offered with a front-wheel drive version to begin with, and even if you go with the all-wheel drive model, as this vehicle is, there's no low-range gear set in the transfer case. Add that to the fact that you don't get much more ground clearance than a station wagon and regular radials, well, a gravel road like this is about as extreme as you want to get. The all-wheel drive system uses a bunch of sensors to monitor wheel slip and is usually fast enough it stays ahead of the game. Under normal circumstances, the system drives the front wheels. Should they break free, a computer-controlled clutch automatically sends 50% of the drive to the rear wheels. Naturally, the CX-7 comes with its share of active and passive safety aids. The anti-lock brakes, for example, which work on vented discs front and rear, deliver fast stops that measure 39.1 meters. 
You'll also find dual side seat mounted airbags and drop down side air curtains to go along with the two front airbags. You know, if you're looking for an SUV, you're barking up the wrong tree if you look at the CX-7. However, if you want a very stylish alternative to a traditional station wagon, this is your vehicle. Great handling, willing engine, and versatility, well, it'll do the lot. Air pressure is critical to a tire. If you want to make an expensive tire perform like a cheap one, just underinflate it. If you have an underinflated tire, it's going to wear out sooner. You'll have to buy new tires with all that extra energy spent, and it relates to safety because the tire could fail if you've run it underinflated. I showed you on the underground camera photos. You can take a tire at 35 PSI and just drop down 5 PSI and guess what? You've lost a lot of traction. We're out running around with a car with lower air pressure in the rear tires. It has 27 PSI in the rear tires. That's uh, down um, about 8 from what's recommended, and, but it's only down 5 from what the pressure is on the front tires. Water is not compressible. When a tire runs over water, it has to go either through the grooves or it will actually lift the tire up off the pavement. With low pressure, the tire cannot resist hydroplaning as well as it can with higher pressure and you lose control. If you have low air pressure, if you put the wrong tires on, you can make a great car terrible. If you take care of your tires, they'll take care of you. Most people tend to equate four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive with better traction, uh, essentially drive-away traction. Uh, in a system like X-Drive, it can be much more than that. It, it can provide some real dynamic benefits. I think the key to that in, in the X-Drive system is that it is proactive. It doesn't wait until you've got a wheel spinning somewhere to transfer some torque to the other wheels. It actually uses a, a quite an elaborate array of sensors to determine what the driver is trying to make the car do and any deviation from that by the car and then putting the, the torque to the wheels as required to make it do what you want it to do. One thing it taught me um, rather dramatically was that in some situations uh, the difference between a dynamic stability control uh, in the vehicle and, and no dynamic stability control is in fact the difference between having some control and having none. And uh, there were situations where when we turned uh, the DSC off, instantly the car just, we lost control completely. The car started to spin and, and we were gone. We had no control over it. So to me that was a very, a very uh, instructive uh, experience. Since recognizing this Grand Vitara on our Car of the Year award show, we've added it to our long-term test fleet. Now, I haven't driven this vehicle very far, but the one thing I have noticed since picking it up, trying to install a child seat is not as easy as it could be. The problem being is where the latches sit for the latch system. Now, the one on this side of the vehicle is fine because when you plug it in, 
you hear the thing click. The one on the left side you do not hear click and therefore you've got to make sure that it's properly snatched into place. Otherwise you're not going to protect the little ones properly. Now down the weeks we've got a lot of things to tell you about this vehicle including what a pain it is to live with a tailgate that's hinged on the wrong side of the car. The new Lexus ES350 comes with an all-new six-speed automatic transmission that utilizes something called World Standard Lubricant. It is maintenance-free. I mean, this vehicle does not even come with a dipstick to check the oil. Now, as you know, our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner, is always nagging us about changing our motor oil, but how about the transmission? Here's Bill. Well, Brad, I'll tell you, it just seems amazing to me that Lexus or Toyota um, you know, if I had to think of one manufacturer that makes their vehicles user-friendly in terms of the mechanics who have to work on them, guys like me, it would have to be Toyota. They're excellent in almost every respect, so it kind of doesn't sit well with me that you don't have a dipstick to check the transmission fluid. But you know what? It makes me think of when Delco went to maintenance-free batteries years and years ago. They took away all the service caps and sealed it up. And, you know, mechanics were up in arms about that, but, you know, we all learned to check the state of charge with the digital voltmeter. And Delco said that half the problem with the batteries was caused by contamination and people damaging the top of the plates when they went in there with a the tester. So, who knows? Maybe they're on the right track, and maybe it'll work for a light-duty vehicle like that. But it, for a sport utility or a pickup, a vehicle that's used heavy-duty, you may have to shorten up the transmission uh, fluid change intervals. So you may want to take a look at that fluid and service it. You know, it, it's an item that's going to be serviceable more frequently if that vehicle's used for work. So, for example, in our Ridgeline pickup, there's our transmission dipstick. When I pull it out, the transmission fluid looks really nice, looks really good, and it should on a vehicle this new. You know, there's a simple way to check it, and you want to check your owner's manual to make sure that you're checking it in the proper way, whether the vehicle has to be running or idling in park or whatever, and it varies from one vehicle to another. Typical interval for changing transmission fluid is about every 50,000 kilometers, but you want to check your owner's manual to make sure that if you're using your vehicle for trailer towing, for example, maybe snow plowing or uh, landscaping, you might want to shorten up those intervals even more, maybe as, as frequently as, as once a year. One thing I did notice in our Ridgeline pickup that doesn't sit well with me is that the engine oil is awful dark. It's pretty black looking and we're not even at the first oil change interval. I've noticed that um, it's down about half a liter so I'm thinking that maybe we should uh, change the uh, motor oil and the filter in this vehicle ahead of its first scheduled maintenance. I also looked at the front tires and it looks like somebody's been driving this vehicle awful hard and that's another thing that's a stress riser for all the lubricants in your vehicle and another reason to change them more frequently. Till next week I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2006. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing the ultimate concept in rugged elegance. We call it the Ford F-250 Super Chief. This concept, as you can see, pushes the limits, not just of how bold and elegant trucks can become. It was inspired by a uniquely American story, the epic journey, and the iconic locomotives of the 20th century, like the Super Chief, that crisscrossed this nation. The front end picks up the powerful geometry of the historic locomotives and marries it to Ford's bold American three-bar grille. And the profile, as you can see, also recalls those great American trains of the past. Ford has spent billions of dollars in the last few years renovating its product line. The F-Series pickup truck is its top seller. It was all new a couple of years ago. Most of that technology was also put into the Explorer last year, but you'd hardly know what to look at it. They haven't changed the styling at all. The 500 sedan and the Freestyle crossover, they haven't sold very well, but they're pretty nice vehicles and they're all new. Even the Focus, which is an old vehicle, was pretty well renovated a couple of years ago. But do you know what the best-selling passenger car in Ford's lineup is? This according to the New York Times, and they haven't lied to me recently as far as I know. It's the Ford Taurus, number two overall to the F-Series pickup truck. I'll bet you didn't even know they still made the Ford Taurus. 
Well, for you, they don't. It's primarily a fleet car. I'm not even sure you can actually buy one one at a time from a Ford store these days. But if you work for a big company and a company car is part of the package, chances are if you're high enough up the pecking order, the Taurus is one of the boxes you get to check. Now, it's kind of ironic because almost 20 years ago, the Taurus was the best-selling car in North America, maybe the world, because the U.S., where it was number one, is the biggest market. It was a very advanced car for its time, but, you know, Ford let it go. They stopped renovating the technology. They put new lipstick on it here and there. Do you remember the fish-faced Taurus? <laughs> Meanwhile, Camry and Accord were all new every four or five years, and in the retail market, they're not only eating Taurus's lunch, they're eating its dinner. So Ford, the only way they can flog them now is to fleets. Now, nobody likes the fleet business because fleet customers can buy lots of cars and they demand big discounts. So there's little or almost no profit in a fleet sale. So why do companies do it? Well, primarily because otherwise the alternative might be to shut the factory down. And that would cost them even more money because of all the obligations they've got from their union contracts. So while Ford would like to get out of the fleet business, they really can't afford to right now. Obviously not a sustainable strategy long term and they hardly need me to tell them that. What they're hoping for is that the also all new Ford Fusion, which is off to a good start, will eventually sell very well in the retail market too and generate some profits. Because Ford, if Taurus is your best selling car, you've got lots to keep you awake at night. I'm Jim Kenzie. You know, one of the nicest vehicles we drove last year was the new Lexus GS series. Plenty of power, but the styling for Lexus was definitely cutting edge. Well, they're adding a new vehicle now to the GS family. It's the 450H. It will be the world's first hybrid luxury performance passenger car. And we'll check that vehicle out on a future program. As for the Lexus ES350, well, what can I say? As I mentioned earlier, it is considered entry level, but it drives and feels like a vehicle worth a lot more than $42,000. And believe me, Toyota doesn't put a dime in this program, but when it comes to fit and finish, it just doesn't get any better. And Graham will talk more about that on a future test drive. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Well, I'm surprised that Kia is still in Canada because if you remember like seven years ago, they came with was basically crap. I mean, bad cars and the dealer network that was just left over from other companies and now they, they're doing pretty well in Canada and worldwide also they're doing pretty well because they have well-priced products which are pretty well uh, adapted to the markets. TSN's Motoring 2006 has been brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses and Michelin, a better way forward.